welcome to church. For those of you joining us online, we're so excited you're here to worship with us. You guys stand as we praise our Heavenly Father. Praise be with that praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. That praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise, let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high with all creation cry. God, we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. Let faith be a song that overcomes the raging sea. Let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Let it We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. Will all creation cry, God, we praise you. heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Welcome, everybody, whether you've joined us online this morning or you're here with us in person, we're so glad that you guys are here. It's so good to be able to worship the Lord together, amen? We're gonna continue to do that through this next song. It says, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in the Father's love. And so I just encourage you guys to really engage with us in worship. Come, come stand in the Father's love with us and come and watch your, your fears and your worries and your concerns fade away as we continue to worship together in the Father's love. tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know oh I won't be shaken no I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance
Father God, we love you. And God, we know that you can transform us, God, that you can revive hearts, you can revive a nation. And God, I just pray that you use each one of us to share your love, to share your hope through us, God. So God, bring revival to our spirits, to our hearts, to this church, to the state, to this country, God. Point, let us allow us, God, to point people to Jesus, to see Jesus, that He's the one who gives us hope. He's the one that gives us life everlasting. God, we love you, we praise you, we worship you. God, speak powerfully into our heart right now as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Guys upstairs, I hope you're good. I just kind of jacked that up upstairs, so sorry about that. Uh, hey, everyone, good morning, or wherever you're watching. If it's the middle of the week later, good to see you there as well online. We're thrilled to have all of you. I don't normally walk up right now, so my brain is not firing properly at the moment. Hey, uh, if you're visiting with us, man, we're thrilled to have you, whether it's online visiting or here in this room. We're so glad you're here. Uh, I want to tell you a couple things that are, that are coming up here at church. We have a, our ladies have what they call their if gathering, which is right around the corner next month. And uh, ladies, we'd love for you to check that out and get signed up. If you text the word 94000, uh, you'll find all, all about all, you'll find all about it find out all about it and uh, how to sign up and how to do all that. Also there, you find out what's happening here at LifePoint and what's going on. So all the announcements are in there, and, and you can check it out there. We encourage you to do that. Also, we encourage you uh, in, in your worship of God, also with your giving through your tithes and your offerings. You can see on the screen, there's different ways that you can do that here as a church. You can give your offering to the Lord, offer your offering as we talked about before. So we encourage you to do that as well. Um, you might have noticed when you pulled in, for those of you who are physically here, pulling in the way the parking lot was kind of set up differently, you, uh, some of you maybe for the first time realize you can actually come around the side here and get to our parking lot from the back, and so we're kind of glad we gave you that opportunity today to figure that out, so uh, very good for those of you who didn't get a uh, parking spot in the very front. All right, well, we're in our final week of this series where we're looking at some important biblical principles as they pertain to our finances. Now, it's important to know that these principles that we're looking at, they pertain to our finances, but they technically they also pertain to our, our, our time and our talent. And so we can certainly look through that grid as well. I encourage you to do that. But specifically in this series, we're looking about this, these principles as it pertains to our finances. And the reason we're doing that is because Jesus knew that what we oftentimes trust in Money, it provides us things that, that don't really provide what it should. We think it will provide us security or comfort or peace or contentment. 
And see, Jesus knew that, that our finances, our money is our biggest obstacle to truly experiencing the abundant life that Jesus has to offer. So today, as we wrap up this series, we're looking at one more final principle. And the final principle is this. It's the principle of generosity. And what I'm hoping to do today is to teach us how to be generous. And, and to be clear, the goal today is not to get you to give. Every one of us gives. I, I'm teaching us today how to be a generous person because that is the truth. You all give. We all do. Every single one of us at some time, somewhere, in various times, every person gives, but not everyone is necessarily generous. And because we give, and for some of us, we give quite a bit of maybe our money or quite a bit of our time or quite a bit of our talents and resources to something, whatever it may be, because we give, we can actually falsely assume that we're generous. A lot of us are, are incredible at random acts of giving to a particular situation or a circumstance or if somebody has a need. And I want to tell you, this is very important, I love that. And I, you know, I encourage that here at Life, but I encourage that that be a part of your life. And we talked about that last week. If you were with us last week, we talked about a, a huge need that has arisen with our ministry partner, uh, New Hope Church, and the gift of groceries that we participate in. I'm not going to go through all the details of that again, but we invited every single person last week, no matter who you are, no matter what your age, young or old, or anything in between, that every single person would pray about and then give to this need so they can replace their parking lot because they served over 40,000 people last year and gave out over a million pounds of food to people who desperately need it. And so we're encouraging you to participate and join in. Last week was great. A lot of people gave. And, and, uh, and somebody uh, took me up on the offer to provide a matching gift. And so we had an individual say, I will give five $1,000 gifts. So they're looking for, it, it, it's like it's money just sitting there. So if you pray about, you might be one of those people say, I'll take one of those $1,000 gifts. I'll give $1,000. You do that, this person matches, and the person will do up to five gifts. So I encourage some of you to be praying about that. That might be where you go. So anyway, we are great. We are great. When there's a need that arises, we step up as a church, as a family, and we give. And I love that, and I encourage that, and I applaud you, and I encourage you to continue to do that. But we have to understand that generosity itself is not the same as random acts of giving. And one of the incredible benefits of us becoming financially generous, not just generous with our time or with our talent, but also with our finances, here's, here's the huge benefit. If we get this principle and we become generous people, not just givers, but generous people, then here's what will end up happening in the long run. We will absolutely give more. And you know what's incredible? We'll end up saving more, believe it or not. And we'll consume less. Jesus said there was another benefit in Acts chapter 20. He said that when you and I order our life around generosity, he said this, we'll actually be happier. And you know, we say it all the time, Jesus isn't concerned about getting your money, right? He isn't concerned about getting your money. What he's concerned about is getting your heart and so Jesus, that's what he was getting at in Matthew chapter 6, um, where he says, where your treasure is, there your heart is. Jesus knew that what you and I do with our money, that just dictates where our heart actually goes, and Jesus wants your heart. So he knows the way to get there is through our finances. So God is inviting every single one of us to a life of generosity. And specifically, as in this series, we're talking about a life of, of financial generosity. Hey, Gary, just saw your co shirt. Cool shirt, man. <laughs> Financial generosity. All right, so here's the question. What is generosity? What is it? How, do, how would we define it? Uh, generosity is th basically three things. Number one, generosity is premeditated. That means that you have a plan, that you decide in advance, here is my plan of how I'm going to be generous. Secondly, generosity is calculated. It's not random. It's not only when a need arises, it, it's calculated. You decide, you determine, here's an amount or here's an, a percentage that I will purposefully, and we talked about this last week, and prayerfully consider and then choose as God leads me. And finally, generosity is designated. 
that you are pre-deciding, you're predetermining where you will send it. And remember last week, we talked about, or a couple weeks ago, we talked about the principle of first. And God said, hey, the first is mine. The first is mine. So it always first goes to God-related priorities. Everyone, regardless of income level, and this can start with our kids and start teaching them when they're young. And then once, and once there's teenagers and they're, and they're earning money, anybody, or whether you're even retired, everybody can be a generous person. Every person can have a plan. Every person can pick a percentage or an amount, and every person can pre-decide where they will send it. And God wants this for you. And he wants this for me. Because this is actually, generosity is actually what frees our heart from the love of money and this death grip of materialism that is so prevalent in our society today. And man, when we get this right, we reach entirely new levels of contentment and we experience joy and peace and freedom on levels that we can't possibly understand outside of being a generous person. Ultimately, we get this right, our hearts will line up and be in tune more and more with the actual heart of God. Now, there's an obstacle to you and I becoming generous people. And it's simply this, is that we tend to think and behave like consumers. You know what a consumer says, a consumer mindset? It says, you know, if that thing comes to me, if something comes to me, it means it's for me. So, so if, if money comes to me, that means that, that money is for me. And, and, and the problem with this behavior is then we end up spending everything we make. Maybe we give a little, but we spend everything we make or even more than we make. And as a result, people who aren't financially generous, they don't end up having financial margin in their life, which I know everybody wants us to have. And they, don't end, up, and they end up having a whole lot of debt. Now, I want to help us see this a little more clearly, so I want to ask you a couple questions, okay? So here's your chance to really think about this. You know, uh, this isn't lot lottery talk, so just right now when I ask these questions, don't include, well, if I win the lottery, okay? So take that off the equation, uh, off the equation. So first question for everybody here, how much more money would you need to break the habit of spending more than you make? So I want you to think about that for a second. How much more would you need? Just, just think through this for a second. You're like, oh, well, you know, if I had 20% more or 30% more or 50% or 100% more, I, then I wouldn't spend more than I make. How much more money would you need to break the habit of spending more than you make? You want to know what the answer is? A whole lot more money than you will ever get at one time. Okay, I mean, think about that. For, for the majority of us, we are not going to all of a sudden get a massive monthly infusion into our life, right? For the majority of us, that's not going to happen. For the majority of us, what happens? We just get slow, steady raises over time, right? Over our career. And as we get those raises, what do we tend to do? We spend, tend to spend everything that comes in. Why? It's not an income issue. It's not a get more issue. It's, oh, it's a, and we're going to talk about the couple issues it is. It's a self-control issue. Next question. How much more money would you need to break the habit of, of using debt? Okay, think about that for a second. How much more money would you need to make, break the habit of debt? So that's like using credit cards or maybe taking seconds out on your mortgage or, you know, borrowing from somebody else. How much more would you need to get the things that you want right now? How much more, another way to say it, how much more would you need so you can start paying cash for everything? And some of you are like, I can't even imagine that. How is that possible? How much more money would you need so that, you're like, man, I got this, but I want to buy this. I want something newer. I want something bigger or better. Every home upgrade, every new TV, every vacation, putting through every child through college. What's the answer? How much more do you need? More than you're going to make at any, more than you're going to get at one time again, right? That's not going to happen, except, all right, we're throwing out lottery, right? Lottery doesn't count. Except some of us, you might get an inheritance, but I will tell you this, based on your habits prior to that, that is just will be a temporary thing. So consequently, as our income goes up steadily, and for some of us, sometimes it even spikes, our habits just continue. 
Our habits don't all of a sudden change. Why? Because this is a contentment issue. It's not a money issue. The more money that we have, the more that we look at what we have and want something different. Have you figured that out? The more that you have, the more that you look at what you have. Oh, man, I I have this 60-inch TV. This is cool, but, man, Costco has a new 85-inch TV. Man, I I got an infusion of cash that I didn't have before. I mean, you know, I got another another stimulus bill coming. Oh, the the tax child tax credit's going up again. I mean, I'm going to be loaded. You know, I got more an infusion of cash. Man, what I have, I think I want it a little bigger now, a little better, a little newer. We end up spending more because it's a contentment issue. All right, third question. How much more would you need to create financial margin in your life and live within your means? I mean, isn't that, wouldn't that be a great thing? To have more money so that there's finally margin that you can live within your means. So what would it be for you? 20% more, 50%, 100%? If you got a 100% raise, would that start suddenly showing up in your savings? Now you have margin. Now you have three to six months of, of, of savings saved up. Would that start? No, maybe a little bit would, perhaps, But would it all show up? Not really. Why? Because with our current habits, the more we continue to make, the more we continue to spend, it isn't a money problem. It's really a discipline problem. Final question. How much more money would you need to stop worrying about money? How much more would you need? Say, you know what, if I could have this, I would stop worrying about money. If my income would increase 50%, man, I'd stop worrying. I make 30 grand. If I could just make 60 grand a year, I would stop worrying. I make 60 grand. If I could make 120 grand, if I make 120 grand, if I can make 240 grand or whatever, pick the number, whatever the number is, how much more would it take so you don't worry about money? You want me to tell you the answer? It's none of those. How do I know that? Because if you make 30 grand, you look at someone who makes 60 grand, they worry about money. Look at someone who makes 60 grand and all of a sudden they worry about money. Look at someone who makes 120 grand, they worry about money. Look at somebody who makes a million dollars, they worry about money. Five million, 10 million, they worry about money as well. Worry isn't a money problem. You know what worry actually is? It's a spiritual problem, isn't it? Worry is a spiritual problem. Jesus did not say to overcome your worries, get more money. That wasn't his solution. What, Jesus didn't say that. Worry is actually a trust issue. The Bible says this in 1 Timothy chapter 6. It says, teach those who are rich in this world. And I've done a message on this before. I don't have time to go in it. But basically, you live in America. For the most part, the majority of people who live in America would fall into the rich category compared to the rest of the world. If you teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust. Say the word trust. Not to trust in their what? In their money. You say, I I, I never trusted my money. No, no. Peter, Jesus, Paul, they all understood this topic. Do not trust in money, which is so unreliable. Their trust, say the word trust. Their word trust should be in who? In who? Say it. And your trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. The reason we worry is our trust is in the wrong place. Don't miss that. The reason that you and the reason that I worry is our trust is in the wrong place. Our finances are a deeply spiritual issue because Jesus understood, Peter understood, Paul understood, they all understood that for us, our trust ends up being in the wrong place. So let me summarize. More money does not generate more self-control. More money does not generate us being more disciplined, or more money does not create for us contentment. More money does not eliminate worry. The issue is not money. So what's the issue? Well, the issue is our false uh, uh, assumption. 
we'll call it the consumption assumption. And that, this false assumption is simply this. If it comes to me, it's for me. If it comes to me, it is for me. And, and, and I want you to hear this. Here's what Jesus said about that in Luke chapter 12. He, he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Say the word greed. Now, this is important because you have to understand context. He says every type of greed. So, so some of you might say, well, is he talking about, you know, our time or our talent? Or, I mean, greed can be all sorts of things, right? No, no, don't miss the context, what he says. Be uh, 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 on your guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. So he's talking finances here. He's talking stuff, materialism. Be on your guard against greed. Life isn't about what you have. For anyone of any income level who by their actions and their behaviors, which really by their habits, if they're living as if with this assumption that what they have is basically for them, sure they give occasionally here and there, but but it's basically for them or for their family. Jesus actually says, that's greed. And he says, if that's you, be aware of it. Be on your guard. Don't miss this. The greedy can still give. Most of us say, I'm not greedy, because I give. The greedy can still give. Some greedy people can give huge amounts. We all give. But you know what Jesus is doing? He's inviting you and I to get off this, you know, greed train, so to speak. He knows that this, if it comes to me, it's for me mentality, it just always, always leads to discontentment no matter your income level, he invites you, he invites me to be transformed, to stop being a consumer, to stop having a consumer mindset, to somebody who says, I'm going to be extravagantly generous. I want to be not a consumer. I want to be an extravagantly, extravagantly generous Jesus follower. So how do we get there? Well, you got to start with how you think, Right? So you have to start with thinking differently. Anybody who goes through any type of program where they're trying to modify and change behavior, it all starts with this idea of thinking differently. You and I are being called to think differently about this. If it is for me, uh, if if it comes to me, it's for me. Think differently about that assumption. Because if we can think differently about it, there's a chance we'll behave differently. So... My favorite passage on this, Jesus tells, it's in Luke chapter 12. If you have your phones, you can go to your version Bible app and go there. You can also uh, um, see the notes on the screen. But in Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells this parable, and a parable is simply a creative story that Jesus tries to get our mind thinking. And, and this is a story we look at every few years. It's one of my favorites because about this topic of greed and consumption, assumption, and, and, and being a generous person. So let's, we're going to run through it quickly today. I don't have a lot of time for it today. But Luke chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 16. And it says this. It says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And so when Jesus said this, everybody listening, their first thoughts were, yep, the rich keep getting richer. Okay, I mean, that, that's what everybody would have thought when he says this. And so they kind of lean in. They're like, oh, this is going to be an interesting story. So this rich man thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. He says, I have so much stuff that already that I've run out of spaces. I've run out of places to store all my surplus. I, I don't have enough garages. I don't have enough barns left. I, I don't, there's not enough storage facilities in the city of Elk Grove. I, I, I have so much. I've run out of places. What should I do? Verse 18, then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my perfectly good barns. Now, it doesn't say perfectly good. I, that's my commentary. I'll tear down my barns, and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. I have so much. And what I have, what comes to me is for me. Remember, that's the assumption. Since all this extra is for me, I need more garages to store it all for me. I need a bigger storage facility for me. Isn't that interesting the mentality he has of his surplus? Because remember, it's a fallacy to think that one day when I have more, 
one day when I'm rich, one day when I have, then I can be generous. See, that's a fallacy to think one day I'll, I'll become that. It's very simple. Rich people are rich. Generous people are generous. There's no correlation between the two. Rich people are rich. Generous people are generous. No correlation. No connection whatsoever. Unless you break the cycle. Unless you and I say, okay, Lord, I want to break this cycle. I want to begin to practice principles of generosity now. I want to begin to put this into my life now so that when I get more, I just won't consume more. I want to make that change now. I, I don't want to live in this space of continually worrying and continually being discontent. I want to practice the principles now. Again, what are the principles? The principles of generosity. They are premeditated, right? You have a plan. They're calculated. It's not random. If you pick a percentage of your income. And third, it's designated. Then you decide where you are going to send it, starting with God-related priorities. Luke chapter 12, verse 19. Then I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Think back to when you got your first paycheck. Some of you a few years ago, some of you a decade, two, three, four decades ago. Think back to that. Remember how much you made, roughly, give or take? Can you imagine looking at yourself back then if it was 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago? And you could, say, you could look ahead and see this is how much you'll make in 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And if you could see that self and go, oh my gosh, man, if I make that kind of money then, man, I'm going to be debt free. If I make that kind of money, I'm going to be worry free. If I'm going to make that kind of money, I will definitely be more generous then. So I just got to ask you a question. How to play out for you? How to go? Is it true? Now for some of us, it is true. Praise God for that. But we know, we just know Typically, historically, you can see it and, you know, talk to the treasurer. You can see it in the books. You can see it in the stories of people's lives. You can see it in how few people even in our country have $1,000 to their name. We know that's not how it played out for people. Most of us make considerably more than we did 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And yet we still have debt. We still aren't content. And we still worry. Why? Why? Because we are committed to the consumption assumption, if it comes to me, it's for me. And so consequently, we just haven't adopted the principles of generosity. So this guy thinks everything's all good. I have so much to spend on myself, man. I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to travel the world. I'm just going to enjoy life. I mean, it sounds like a dream life, right? Okay, let's look at the story. Jesus goes on. He says in verse 20, but God, anytime there's a but God, man, you really want to dial in, tune in, pay attention. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Now, God didn't call him a fool because he was rich. God called him a fool because he didn't understand. He was confused. He thought he had plenty of time. He thought he could spend on himself. He could consume for himself. He could save for himself. But Jesus said in the story, but but tonight the guy dies. And then Jesus asked him a question. It's the same question Jesus asked you and I. Verse 20. Tonight your life's going to be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? So if you die tonight, who gets what you have prepared for yourself? What's the answer? Somebody else. All that stuff that you or I can save to consume for ourselves, he doesn't get to use it. Somebody else does. And then Jesus, who's the most brilliant teacher of all, He says something here. He steps out of this parable. He turns to the audience. So they're gripped by this story. And he turns to the audience and he says, this is how it will be. Now this, that's future tense. What is the this? He says, this is how it will be. This means basically total loss for the guy, right? It's total and complete loss for this guy because his whole life was about saving and spending for himself. Here it is. Here's the knife in the coffin. Jesus says, this is how it's going to be with those who store up things for themselves, but are not rich towards God. That's the story. Jesus says, 
It's a total loss. If we do not invest or we do not send our, and that's the stories about finances, send our financial resources to God-related stuff and God-related priorities. Here's the principle of generosity from this story. Generous people don't assume that all that they have is for them. The consumer mindset says, if it comes to me, it's for me. Generous mindset says, all that comes to me is not just for me, it's also for others. It's actually also for God-related priorities. Generous people, they recognize and realize that since it'll all be taken away from them eventually, have you... (laughs) I think most of us understand, sometimes we don't think about it, but we never know when our tonight, this very night is, right? I mean, we like to hope and pray we have a long life, but we don't ever know when that tonight, this very night is for us. Generous people understand, since it's all going to be taken away, and Jesus said, if I I, I can spend it on myself or I can be financially generous and rich towards God-related stuff... And if I just spend on myself, Jesus said that's a total loss. And so since it'll be taken away, I want to send it towards God-related priorities right now. Not later, because I don't know how much later I have. I want to do it right now. So once again, the principle or the principles of generosity, generosity is predetermined. It's premeditated. You say, I have a plan. Here's my plan. And the plan includes that it is calculated. You sit down, you pray, you talk if you have a spouse or somebody with you, and you pray and you talk about it and you say, it's going to be calculated. It's going to be this amount. It's going to be this percentage. And finally, generosity is designated. You decide, you predecide where it's going to go. Started with God related priorities. And we talked about that the principle of first. So as we wrap it up, let me just throw this out. Does this topic get under your skin? Does this topic make you angry or frustrated? Maybe at me, maybe at LifePoint, or maybe at the church in general. If that's the case, that alone should tell you God is speaking to you. That should tell you the Holy Spirit is trying to grab your heart. That should tell you that there's some trust issues going on in your life. That should tell you that there's something in you that isn't fully ready to embrace what Jesus has called us to. That there's something inside of you that has yet to recognize that the topic of our finances is a deeply spiritual issue. Listen, Jesus knows The way to get you to fully surrender your heart to him, to surrender your life to him, he knows it's through the path of our finances, even if we don't want to admit it. He just knows it. And he knows that once you get this right, you'll experience an abundant life that you can't possibly imagine. So while you have time, while you have time, let's practice the principles of generosity. Let's move from being a giver to be an extravagantly generous Jesus followers. Let's have a plan. It's premeditated. Let's pick a percentage or an amount, and let's choose where to send it first, starting with God. Because everything you have, it's eventually going to vanish. Everything. But what you invest in can reap eternal results. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you with this message today, God, I know that there's some, when they listen, they get so excited because, God, they, they've practiced these principles. And they get excited because they know what can happen if one more, two more, ten more, a hundred more people get this right in their lives. And so, God, they listen enthusiastically. They even listen through the lens of what are you saying to them this time? God, I know they're even praying now, and God, they're wanting and desiring more and more people to experience what they've experienced. So God, would you hear our prayers? God, for those who just are still wrapped up in the consumption assumption, and God, I pray you'd help them. We do these series every year, and God, we're always hoping and pray that you grab a few more hearts, you change a few more lives.
And I pray that that has happened today. So I'm going to ask you, right where you're sitting, if you're walking and listening online or wherever you are, would you take a moment, and if you're willing, would you pray something like this? Say, Lord God, I want to be generous. I don't want to just be a giver. I want to be generous. So I make the commitment to practice the principles of generosity. I'm going to come up with a plan. I'm going to calculate an amount, and I'm going to pre-decide where I send it. Because, God, I recognize everything I have for me is not just for me. It's for others. It's for God-related priorities. So, God, I lay my heart before you. Give me the strength, the boldness, the courage, the faith, the trust to follow through. And I pray this in Jesus' name. God, would you hear every single one of these prayers? Transform us and change us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, we try to finish a tad early uh, because we have something going on in the parking lot right now. This topic, as we finish this series of generosity, we're talking about finances, but I want you to think about it. It also applies to our time and our talents. And think about this. The principle still applies, that you can have a plan of what you're going to do with your time and your talent, that you can, you can have a plan, you can pick a percentage, so to be, speak. It's a calculated an amount of time that you dedicate and devote your time and your talent to something, and you choose, you designate where you're going to send your time and your talents, starting with, again, the principle, starting with God first. So what we're doing today is we have what we call Connect Sunday. It's an opportunity for every one of us to use our time and our talent for God's kingdom so that God's church can grow and thrive. I'm going to ask Pastor Derek to come up. He's going to tell us some of the details of this. But I'm hoping this. Again, we try to finish a few minutes early. Uh, We're going to invite you to head out. Actually, Derek will give you all the details. Um, But I'm hoping you will put this into your life as well, the principles of generosity. It's not just for me. My time and talent is not just for me. My time and talent is also for others, for God-related priorities, so that God's kingdom can grow. So, Pastor Derek, take it over. All right. Um, For those of you who are in the room, sit tight just for a second. I'm going to share some information with our online audience uh, and let them know kind of what's going on, and then I will let you guys know what's going on here on campus this morning. Uh, So for those of you joining us online, we want to invite you to our our Digital Connect Sunday experience, which is going to be happening later this afternoon on Zoom from 12.15 to 12.45. And so during that time when you jump on your computer, uh, you'll be able to chat with a bunch of different ministry leaders and explore various ministry opportunities that are going to be going on here and around the church, Um, and some of which, some of those volunteer opportunities, you can even do from home. We have a few online ministry opportunities as well. Uh, And so be sure to check those out. And so to see all of the volunteer opportunities and to get the Zoom link for later today, all you need to do is text the word Connect Sunday to 94000 and follow the prompts once you get that text. So text Connect Sunday to 94000 and then follow the prompts and that'll give you all of the volunteer opportunities as well as the Zoom link so that you can join us online later this afternoon. And so thanks so much for joining us today for our service. Hope to see you at 1215.